Tilburg University and MindLabs present Taisig Talks, the podcast that keeps you updated on the latest developments in the field of artificial intelligence in just one hour. Welcome to this Taisig Talk. My name is Peter Sponk. I'm a professor of computer science. And in this talk, we give attention to some of the aspects of artificial intelligence, in particular aimed at Tilburg University. In previous talks, we often discussed artificial intelligence, and uh, artificial intelligence has got a lot of attention in the news recently. And what we see is that artificial intelligence is seen by many people as some kind of danger. We see a lot of threats being discussed in the news uh, with respect to, for instance, the job market, to education, um, to privacy uh, uh, aspects, to um, the spread of false information, uh, even criminal activities. And uh, in this way, people are starting to think that artificial intelligence is something that is to be avoided and that we should uh, be fearful of. However, what I wanted to give attention to in this particular talk is the positive sides of artificial intelligence. And that is why I invited uh, two people here, uh, Marlene Balfort and Wouter de Bane, uh, who, will, who I will have a talk with about the Zero Hunger and Zero Poverty Labs that Tilburg University is organizing. So um, I would like to start with you introducing yourself uh, for a moment. Marlene, can you start, please? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Marlene Balvert. I'm an assistant professor in operations research and machine learning uh, at the Zero Hunger Lab. Okay, and Wouter? I'm Wouter de Bane. I'm associate professor in the cognitive neuropsychology department, and I'm part of the Zero Poverty Lab. Okay. Well, um, that is a very uh, tight introduction of yourself, but probably we get to learn more about you when we start talking about these labs. So there are, these are two labs. One is the Zero Hunger Lab, um, which has been in existence since, I think, 2019. Yes. 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 And then the Zero Poverty Lab has just been started few months ago? A few months ago, yes. yes. Okay, so let's start with the Zero Hunger Lab because um, that has been in existence for a while and has been inspiration for the Zero Poverty Lab. So Martin, can you tell me a bit about the Zero Hunger Lab? What is it? What are its goals? Uh, what kind of activities do you, ex do you have? Uh, what kind of people are involved? Which kind of organization are involved? So the whole getting caboodle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the Zero Hunger Lab uh, has as a goal uh, to help NGOs and governments uh, to help better. And NGOs? And uh, non-governmental organizations. Okay. Uh, yeah. So you could think of UNICEF, the World Food Program, uh, this type of organizations. Um, and uh, we do so, so our goal is to reduce hunger in the world using mathematics and data science. Um, and uh, we do that uh, through several projects. So, uh, of course, our baseline is research. We're universities, so we conduct research. Um, and each research project is centered around a PhD student and one of those organizations, or maybe a government, uh, governmental organization. Um, maybe it's easiest to give you an example. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, uh, one of our researchers uh, works with the World Food Programme. And uh, the World Food Program, you probably know them, so they're from the United Nations and they distribute food across the world to places uh, where it's most necessary. Uh, for example, they're active currently in uh, Afghanistan, Yemen and many other places. Um, but they do more. So they also advise governments. Uh, so hunger is not just not having enough food. It's not just about not getting the calories, but it's also about malnutrition, uh, having insufficient nutrients in your food. Because um, you can get enough food, but if you don't get the nutrients, development and health uh, are just not possible. Um, so uh, one of the things that the World Food Program does is a, a project called Fill the Nutrient Gap. They look in a country or a region uh, at uh, the amount of money that uh, a family earns and the amount of money that a family needs to have a nutritious diet. Uh, and if you compare them, you see uh, that there might actually be a gap 
between them. And based on that gap, they can then advise governments on interventions that they can take. For example, uh, should they give out uh, school meals or should they enforce these school meals with certain nutrients, fortification, uh, that's what it's called. Now, before that, they of course have to know the amount of money that you need for a nutritious diet. Uh, so there's a bunch of calculations going on in there. And uh, what they use is a mathematical optimization model to determine the, uh, the least cost that you need to get a diet that is sufficiently nutritious. Now, that mathematical optimization model is, that is one of the things that we are working on. So uh, one of our PhD students is working on the mathematics behind that. And one of the things that the World Food Program now also wants to take into account is the environmental footprint. Because um, climate change has an effect of on hunger, uh, on food security. So this is an important aspect. You can go for the cheapest diet, but if that is uh, causing a high uh, environmental footprint, you're um, carrying water to the sea, basically. Uh, so this is something they want to take into account now as well. And that makes the problem much more complex because you're now balancing not only nutrition, not only price, but also environmental aspects. Yeah. Um, so this makes it mathematically more complex. Now, this PhD student is working together with the World Food Program, together with also Capgemini, who then do the implementation. So now you see the different partners collaborating, research, uh, NGOs, uh, and industry together to create uh, a tool that can help the World Food Program. Okay. Um, there's probably a lot more that we can say about that. Uh, I, when you were talking like that, I'm thinking about models that I also developed in the past for particular other problems. And one of the things that I've found is that it's very easy to get out of the model that you politically want to get out of it. So this is... So how do you guard against that? Because you already say, well, there are lots of aspects that you want to take into the model, yep. but probably if you want to make the model complete in some sense, there's even a lot more that has to go into it. So so where, how do you take decisions on that? And how do you make sure that decisions that you take um, uh, are in line with the goals of the Zero Hunger Lab? Yeah. So in this case, um, uh, actually in all the cases, but specifically in this case, uh, our models do not take the decisions. Our models give insight. So this model gives insight to the World Food Program how these different aspects can balance. Um, uh, for example, if you uh, have the choice uh, between a low carbon footprint and low cost, there is of course some sort of trade-off between them. And we can give the insight in how that trade-off looks uh, the model will not give one answer. It will really use all the data that is available and all the mathematics that we can use to give insights to the World Food Program. Okay, and uh, the the okay the, the 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 Zero Hunger Lab has been in existence now for three and a half years or so. Um, so evidently, it's a success. Uh, evidently, what you're doing uh, it gives enough reason to let it continue existing. So. Uh, has it been growing? Has it uh, gotten more attention? Uh, so can you say a bit about that? So how is, the, how, is, how is it now and what does the immediate future, what does it look like? So the project that I just mentioned was one of the first projects. Uh, this was also one of the first PhD students we started out with. Um, and then we were just a very small group. But in the meantime, we've grown to nine PhD students, um, six uh, people who supervise these PhD students and support the lab. Uh, and uh, also a group of master students who uh, write their master thesis either in support of these PhD students, researchers, or to do some explorative research. And usually we have somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, master students walking around. So it has definitely been growing. Yeah. Yeah. And for people who don't know, a PhD student is a somebody who is working on a thesis and has four years of research usually exactly. yep. and so and there's some cost involved so who's who's paying for that who, who's getting who's getting the money into the lab to be able to do all this work so there are different uh, uh money flows coming in uh, there is uh, the university itself uh, so uh, both tysem and the university in general um the tysem is the economic the, the economic faculty yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, at the start, uh, uh, a big sponsor for us was uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, so they supported us for the first couple of years, uh, still supporting us uh, until this summer. Um, but there's also private uh, donors 
Um, and of course, uh, as every researcher does, we also apply for research grants. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is a, a brief overview of uh, the Zero Hunger Lab, but we'll get deeper into this and particular projects uh, a bit later. But Wouter, um, the, the Zero Hunger Lab has been an, an inspiration to start something else, namely the Zero Poverty Lab. And actually, the Zero Hunger Lab started at the economics uh, faculty and the Zero Poverty Lab started at the behavioral science faculty, right? Yes, but in close co collaboration with... Uh, the Zero Hunger Lab, because it was a uh, very nice inspiration uh, given their success and also this kind of research they are doing. Um, so we were inspired um, by that and we wanted to do something about poverty um, with the focus on the individual person. So we don't want to change systems per se, we want to start from the individual. We want to examine how poverty affects uh, people uh, yeah, we're from the so, uh, social and behavioral sciences, so we're interested in behavior of people and more uh, specifically in um, cognitive functions um, like attention, memory, um, executive functions. So how can people plan their actions for the future? And um, there is already some research showing that poverty and all things related to poverty, because it's really a multifaceted uh, uh, problem, in which uh, impoverished nutrition also plays a role. So there you already see the match between the two um, the labs. Um, so we see that poverty has an effect on the brain and on specific brain regions and networks that uh, are involved in these executive functions, making people actually um, make decisions for the short uh, run. So they don't plan for the future. So their decisions are made for... Um, getting a reward or um, getting a reward on the short run. And that's actually the start uh, for research. We want to get more insights into how different uh, facets of poverty affect um, these networks. Uh, also, when exactly these uh, effects uh, occur. So during the lifetime, we look at a, a lifespan perspective. So probably the effects are largest uh, if people... Um, um, are born in poverty, but even when they are adults, poverty might have a, a large effect on the brain. So we want to uh, get more insights about that relationship um, because that insight can then um, uh, yeah, provide us tools uh, for interventions. So the brain is uh, still plastic or there's some plasticity, so the brain can adapt so if we have interventions that uh, tap into specific uh, processes, specific networks in the brain, um, we can get um, yeah, better results and actually breaking the circle of people making the wrong decisions, leading to more poverty and actually uh, their children and also um, get into poverty. If we can break that circle uh, by these interventions, by providing insights um, to people who can make a difference, also to governments, uh, NGOs. Um, that's actually the main uh, goal of this lab. But it's, it sounds rather complex. Well, it, it is, I would actually think it would be fairly simple, at least the way you started it, namely, look, if if I am in poverty or maybe I am hungry uh, and and I, I somebody tells me look here there's some food but if you spend this in the right way then you get more food in three weeks but yeah i'm hungry now i'm gonna eat it now and the same with with, with poverty so i if i can get a little bit of money right now I, because i need to spend it on something particular i'm gonna do it and um then it sounds like a simple solution to give people enough now and enough for the future um, but that's probably maybe this is too simplistic a way to look at it or Yes, so we just started. So there are some uh, studies looking into the effect of giving money to uh, uh, to mothers, for instance. Uh, but we don't know what what uh, these people do with that money. Okay, uh, maybe they spend it on good food, or they just spend it on clothes. And so we don't have that insight yet. So that's also one of uh, um, the research questions we have. Imagine, indeed, you give uh, money to to people. How do they spend it? And uh, what would be the best way to spend it? Mm. 
Um, but poverty is probably not only about money, right? Or no. is that the way that you translate it? That's the, that's uh, exactly the point. So it's not only related to pov- uh, to to money. It's also related to uh, be deprived of good food, of a good education, of good social contacts. So it's much more than uh, than money. And we should look into all these different uh, facets and see which has the most effect uh, on the behavior and the the way these facets have uh, effect on behavior is through the brain. That's why we focus on the effects on the brain okay. because that's actually the mediator between these factors and uh, the behavior of people. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, one more question and then I want to get more into the, t- into the technology. But the, I've been reading for the last few years and maybe this is simply too optimistic, but there are people who say, Look, poverty is actually getting erased from the world. If you look how, how, if you look at how poverty was, let's say, 10 years ago and five years ago and right now, and then maybe the COVID actually had a negative effect, but in general, poverty is get, getting removed from the world. Is that correct? And if so, how how does is that happening? Well, there has been a, a large improvement in, yeah, the last... 25 years up till 2015. Um, actually, I think the best moment was 2018. So they go from um, more than 35% uh, of the, the world population living in poverty. Um, so that has been, this has improved. And I think they went below the 9%. So there was a huge improvement. Uh, but then you already mentioned uh, COVID, uh, but it's not only COVID, it's also other conflicts uh, uh, like uh, the Russia-Ukraine co- uh, conflict, uh, but also um, climate crisis. So the numbers have been rising since 2018. Um, and of course, there's a lot of poverty in the world, um, but even in developed countries uh, like mm-hmm. the Netherlands, there are a lot of people living in poverty. Not that these are extreme forms, but still... Um, People live in poverty, and also these numbers have been rising again. So they they are now above uh, one million uh, people in the Netherlands living in poverty. Uh, so that's why we also first want to focus on the Netherlands, um, and that's something we're going to talk about later, I guess, because we do have data uh, for developed countries, so we can get an insight about uh, the underlying uh, mechanisms. And if once we have that insight, we can tr- try to translate that to uh, uh, other countries that are less developed. Of course, knowing already that maybe other factors might uh, play mm-hmm. a role there. Yeah. So the okay, the, I, I'm thinking the focus is probably look. So we've seen have seen improvements in the world that has helped a lot of people, but not everybody. And there's probably a group that you cannot help with. I don't know exactly what the things are that have been happening that help people. Probably. A lot of technological development uh, was part of that, that people were able to produce food, for instance, more effectively, which helps a group of people, but not everybody, because it only affects people for whom the food was the problem. Um, But getting it to zero poverty or zero hunger, that means that you have to help everybody. And and is is that the idea that the focus should be on the people that could not be helped with what has been improving in the world, uh, but now you have to find out why you can't help those people, at least why they were not helped and how you can help them further. Is that is that a good translation? I'm looking at both of you here. Yes, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, yeah. of course, you should make that remark, not <laughs> I, but okay. But you're now, you're now also referring to the names of the labs, right? Um, yes. So uh, the Zero Hunger Lab is called the Zero Hunger Lab because of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, you may know them, the United Nations and all the countries uh, related to that have pledged uh, on a number of goals, 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The second is Zero Hunger and the Zero Hunger Lab. The first is related to poverty. Uh, so basically our labs are inspired by these first two Sustainable Development Goals. With the ultimate goal... Uh to yeah, remove all hunger and uh, poverty in the world, which is very idealistic, of course, but 
we want to try to make baby steps first. Yeah, but you have to be idealistic because if you say, well, 2% hunger is okay, then that last 2% of people is, of course, I would say screwed. And uh, uh, no, you you are also part of the, the humanity and we should help you as well. Um, so uh, but what I am, because as I said, well, this we, we talk now about goals and about the effect uh, that you have on the world or could have on the world. Um, but I am very much interested in the technology that is behind this. So how do you, and you, Martin, you already mentioned um, the, the idea of uh, building models. Um, but if you want to build a model, of course, you need a lot of things. You need uh, data, you need certain technology to to get that data into a shape that it is a model and that you can do predictions. So can you tell us a little bit about, and that's for both of you, of course, so what kind of uh, technology, well, Marlene, you're using already technology. So what, what do you use? What do you need? How can it be improved? And why can we do this now? And um, so this time in history. And of course, for Wouter, I have the same thing, but of course you're still starting out, but but still you probably have things that you can tie into there as well. But Marlene, maybe you can start on that. Yeah, um, so uh, there's actually a variety of sorts of technology. Uh, and that's all depending on the question that you're answering. So in the previous example that I gave, uh, I talked about mathematical optimization because it's an optimization problem. Um, uh, but there is also uh, a lot of technology that uses, uh, for example, public data. Um, you might want to predict when uh, hunger strikes somewhere, and that's a lot of factors going in there. It could be a, a drought or it could be conflict. Um, and uh, one of the other projects that we're doing is on predicting when hunger strikes based on uh, public data, social media data. Um, for example, in, uh, in Somalia, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, conflict going on. And based on social media, you can already see certain semantics coming up. So through semantics analysis on this social media, you can uh, predict uh, pretty well, actually, uh, this one of our what's one of our researchers showed, you can predict pretty well when uh, conflict starts rising, hence hunger becomes an issue as well. But actually, there's lots of, of, of uh, uh, data science techniques. Uh, public data is there, uh, non-public data. And if you then ask, uh, why does this it become possible now? Well, that becomes possible with lots of public data becoming a day available, with technologies becoming available, but also with the realization that um, to solve this kind of questions, you need people from different disciplines. Um, so also now that the dis interdisciplinarity is uh, becoming more of common ground, uh, we have more knowledge in the same project and hence we can tackle this kind of questions. And why is interdisciplinarity becoming more common ground? Well, um, it's becoming more common to to collaborate between disciplines. It's very classical to stay within your own discipline and, and work that out very carefully. Um, but now that we have all this data, we have all these techniques, we want to answer these questions. We have to work interdisciplinary. Can, can I make a suggestion there? Because now you, now you say it like this, I'm thinking. So what I saw is I, I, I've, been, I've been working in computer science for 30, 35 years now. And computer scientists were really working on their own things and they had troubles communicating with people outside uh, computer science. So they, they built applications, okay, and then people use them. But nowadays you see that there is a, uh, by having tools being developed, it makes com the technologies of computer science more accessible to other sciences. But these other scientists start using this and then they come with new questions and then computer science gets involved again to solve those new questions. So is, is, is that the reason that this is, or what do I you think? think? It's one of the aspects, yes. And okay, another thing that, um, and the things that you remarked is, you were talking about social media and this is something that I am, if I'm, if I'm I'm a technology optimist. I, I, I love technology and I think it can help us do a lot of things, but I see a big danger in social media and there are many dangers in social media, of course. But one big problem, at least with social media, is I think that only something like 10 or 15% of the people actually are involved with social media. So you get 
limited information, which feels like it is information about everybody, but it's only about a limited group of people. Is that correct, what I'm thinking in, 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 in this, let's say, in the scenarios that you're sketching? Or, um, and, and how do you deal with that? Um, so we do not entirely know that yet. So, of course, you're correct. There's only a small portion of the people uh, active on social media. Hence, you miss out on the others. Um, so I think that this one particular study that I just mentioned about predicting conflict in Somalia showed that uh, this small group of people gives you enough information to show the big trends that are going on in a certain region. Um, but yeah, we should be aware that we might actually be missing out on uh, on things that are going on that are not affecting the people who are not on social media. Yeah. Yeah, and I think if you talk about zero hunger and zero poverty, yes. the people that you're interested in are probably not very active on social media. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, and that's a danger for sure. Yeah, I'm looking at Wouter <laughs> because yeah, that's you are, very you're starting out on something. So <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. So. Um, going back to the question, why now? Um, well, if we want to answer our question and focus on the link between poverty, the brain and cognition, we need a lot of data. And imaging data is per definition very uh, expensive. So people have done studies that are very small. Um, so maybe 20, 30 subjects in one study, but that doesn't allow you to study uh, yeah, things like poverty. So in the last, let's say, decades, there have been some initiatives um, to collect data uh, on a wide scale and also make them publicly available. So for instance, uh, the UK Biobank, uh, to name one, um, they have a database of about 500,000 people, uh, of which up to now about 60,000 people were scanned. So that kind of numbers were, uh, yeah, we could not imagine that uh, a few years ago. Um, but then going back to the point of representati uh, representativeness, um, that might also be a, a problem in those databases. So these databases become available, but people in poverty might be underrepresented in these databases. So we have to be very careful about that and uh, yeah, use techniques to actually weigh them more um, so that we really can examine um, what's going on in that population. Now, another aspect why now is, uh, as Marlene already alluded to or actually mentioned, is uh, that people uh, work more and more uh, together from different disciplines. And Tilburg University really focuses also on that interdisciplinarity and on really bringing a different um, departments, but also different faculties together. And think of the Zero Poverty Lab, uh, the collaboration itself by, with uh, Zero Hunger Lab is a very nice example of that because the research we are doing, we have a focus on the brain. So uh, these newer imaging techniques, um, the expertise should come from our side, but um, all the ana analysis techniques uh, we are talking about now we actually need input from uh, people with more expertise on that side. So only when you bring these two uh, disciplines together, you can do this kind of, uh, of research. Yeah. So you, you mentioned imaging techniques. Um, what exactly do you mean? By, because I, I, let's say I'm, I'm f pretty, pretty interested in, as you say, well, we have lots of data, uh, but what is that data? And especially when you talk about imaging, it's probably not that you talk about people taking photographs in the street. You're talking no. about something else. Yeah, we're talking about <coughs> neuroimaging data. So this is really um, putting people into the scanner uh, in hospitals and then um, yeah, scanning them in different ways. So we can, depending on what kind of scan you make, you can get an insight about the structure or anatomy of the brain, but also on uh, how the, the brain functions. Um, so you can look into how these different structures actually connect to each other. So what are, are the structural connections between these brain regions? But you can also look at how do they uh, work together? Um, so how they are functionally connected. So you can imagine if uh, you divide the brain into, let's say, 200 brain regions, and you compute all connections, 
both from a structural perspective and from a functional perspective, you get already quite uh, complex data. Um, and for instance, uh, yeah, we know that these two things are related to each other. So the functioning of the brain is actually bounded by the way they are structured. But the exact link between these two is not clear because there are very much individual variability. Uh, there's a lot of individual variability. One way of examining this link is by using uh, deep learning. So we have had uh, some studies uh, trying to predict how your um, brain regions interact with each other based on how they are structurally connected. That works to some extent, um, but again, you need a lot of data um, to really um, make that work enough because at, at uh, the next phase is then try to predict uh, the behavior of people from uh, the functioning of the brain. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you mentioned now so many things that I have so many questions on, on that. <laughs> because, okay, I, I, I know a bit about deep learning and actually had one podcast about deep learning, about the technology. What is it? What can you use it for? And then you say, well, we have 60,000 people went in the scanner. But then I think, yeah, that sounds like a lot. But this is an incredibly complex problem and so first of all people you talk about poverty but the, the way people are in poverty will differ from person to person so in some way you have to represent that and then you have you mentioned 200 brain regions and then at some point i'm thinking 60,000 people is actually not that much yes so and, but but also it's very hard to get because it is a it is a lot of course if you talk about brain imaging but uh it, it, making the just say well we make it 120,000 that would be an enormous amount of work and maybe not even possible yes so good news is uh, the UK biobank plans to uh, scan 100,000 people so okay. that will improve <laughs> but I agree the data is so complex um, that we need a lot of data but there are ways of um, yeah, clustering um, those structural connections, for instance. Mm -hmm. So we can look at specific networks and yeah, make it much easier. Uh, it's still quite complex. Uh, but instead of looking at all possible connections, we can reduce that number uh, by using uh, specific uh, techniques that actually cluster regions uh, that collaborate with each other. So we can use graph theory um, to describe different networks how efficient are they, how, how, how they are clustered. So you can use different um, metrics to describe these, uh, these brains of people. And then you reduce the complexity of uh, the description of those brains. So that's one way of dealing with the complexity. Um, but in the end, you want to see how these different things are related with each other. So how does do the, all these different factors of poverty affect the structure that then limits or bounds the functioning of the brain and then that affects cognition. So we also, if, if you want to communicate that with people, you should be able to visualize that. So that's also one thing we want to do. We want to construct a dashboard um, using data, visualization, the data visualization to to show, yeah, what if you uh, manipulate one of these factors? You give money, for instance, to people, uh, so you have that financial aspect. What effect does it have on the brain and then on cognition? But for instance, uh, if you provide them with uh, more healthy foods, what effect does it have? So these are all the factors uh, that we want to look into and see how that affects uh, the brain, how that affects cognition, and also communicate that to the stakeholders. Um, using data visualization techniques. Well, uh, 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 the way you were describing, I'm thinking probably zero hunger is much easier than zero poverty, because hunger you cannot define in the in the in the in terms of nutrients uh, and as well uh, amount and nutrients probably, and then then you have this reasonably sussed out probably, and and that is probably a lot easier to measure than what what Walter is trying to do, but but but. I'm now probably overlooking certain complexities there as well. So what kind of data are you using and, and, and what kind of data do you need? And 
So at the individual level, uh, hunger is, in, I guess, indeed much uh, simpler in that sense that it's one of the effects that impacts the brain. Um, but then if you look at a more uh, a macro scale, uh, in, in the case of hunger, you're looking at system, systematic problems, uh, which is a different type of complexity. That also means that the type of data that you uh, use when you're working on zero hunger are more about um, uh, economic data, um, logistics data, climate data, conflict data, all that sort of stuff, um, information about refugees. Um, it's, it's more systemic data rather than based on the individual. I understand, yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, you probably, it's not, okay, we make a change here and then things are solved because it is uh, long-term. You, yes. you, you make changes to af affect the world yeah. in years and, and maybe even longer exactly. like periods of time. Exactly, yeah. And the, the, the way we try to do that is by giving uh, organizations the tools to do this. And those tools are then based on data science, AI, mathematics. Okay. I, I also, so um, maybe, maybe if, is there more that you want to say about this? Because I want to talk about one particular project that I know about by chance. But, uh, because uh, I know that, and I know this because some people from my department were involved with that, is that they actually work with imaging data. And you mentioned imaging data, but this is actually images of people uh, where they running a project. So can you say something about that? Because it's a different kind of data than what you have been talking about until now. Yeah, I think you may, uh, you're you talking about uh, detecting malnutrition in children. Yes. Um, yes, so this is a, a project uh, that we do together with a uh, German organization, Welthungerhilfe. Uh, so what Welthungerhilfe is developing is an app. And the app can simply take a photo of a child uh, and then uh, the app is uh, ideally saying, this child is malnourished, uh, hence needs help, or this child uh, is okay. Um, because what currently organizations are doing is uh, they need all the, the, the measurements, uh, the scale and, and lots of other stuff uh, to figure out the height, the weight of that child and then figure out whether they are malnourished. We have the, the, the uh, consultatie bureaus, I don't know the word in English, but you bring your child to a bureau, they get measured, checked, every once in a while to check up the, on their health. They don't have that in many countries. So the app would be a way to make that very quick and easy to detect uh, which children are malnourished. Um, behind that app is of course an algorithm that uh, based on a photo of a child can make that prediction. Uh, so then you go back to the deep neural networks again. Um, and the algorithm that is indeed uh, what we're working on uh, Again, a collaboration between faculties, Tyson and uh, TSHD. Um, and then you go really into the uh, artificial intelligence of image analysis. Now, um, this field of, of uh, predicting uh, body shape measurements from a photo uh, has been around, has been around a little bit mostly for the fashion industry or the gaming industry. Um, but this is all about adults. Uh, not about children, and we're looking at children under the age of five because that's where malnourishment has a huge effect. Um, hence, there is uh, little knowledge, but there's also very little data. Uh, we, there is no data on uh, children with their body shape measurements. Uh, it's also super sensitive data. So the first step that we had to take in this project was collect data. Uh, and that's what our uh, PhD researcher has done uh, uh, over the past year. She has collected data uh, so far in one region, but you've got to start somewhere, uh, and we can start training models with that. Okay, but that's probably, you need a lot of data to do this. And yes. I don't see one PhD student gathering all that data, but there's probably collaboration there locally. There's collaboration yeah. going on, yes, absolutely, yeah. 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 Uh, okay, and that is then, yeah, and then you get, of course, the issue again. It's one, that is what you hear a lot nowadays when people complain about AI is that, okay, it's trained, but it's trained on this group of people. And now you're excluding that group exactly. of people, and we get wrong information about that yeah. group of people. And, uh, but because you try to apply it everywhere, but it only works in a limited yes. space. Yes, and that's definitely a challenge. So, like I said, we now have data from one location, from Sulemania in Kurdistan. Um, which is one specific group of children, 
Um, but children's bodies all across the world are very different. Um, so, of course, the next step would then be to extend this uh, to uh, a larger, definitely more diverse population. Yeah, I, I can tell you how I probably would, would try to solve this myself, is setting up some kind of, kind of pipeline where you say, look, if you want to have this for your region, then these yeah. are the steps and here's our software this, and this yeah. is what you need to do. Yeah. And then you feed this, your data that you collected into the software and then you get a model and that model, and then we're going to can that test that model for you. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, but and that's then the next step, going from research to a little bit more towards implementation. Yes. And this is usually where uh, we move uh, to uh, the our partners again. Yes, because the, at at some point the university has to say, okay, our yeah. work is well not done, but <laughs> this is better taken up by someone else now. Exactly, yeah. with a different yeah. expertise. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, how do you envision uh, this, about uh, So, because. <laughs> Your first step is probably going to test. Okay, that now now I'm going to put words in your mouth. So, so let 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 you tell that yourself. So what what is the? You're probably going to start somewhere and say, okay, we'll see how this goes. And and but where do you want to go? And, of course, we're and, driven and, by the availability of data, as we already mentioned. And there are some databases in the Netherlands um, that are very nice, but they are still much smaller than, for instance, UK Biobank or some databases in the in the States. So we want to start with the largest ones and try to find links, as uh, I explained before. But then we want to see if it gen generalizes to people in the Netherlands, because our focus is first on the Netherlands, and then we want to, uh, to make the next step. But first, uh, try to see uh, how that relationship is in the Netherlands. So we need to try to generalize our findings um, to the Netherlands on those smaller scale databases. And uh, yeah, the one way of doing that is uh, we're thinking of using, for instance, explainable AI to see what kind of features uh, really drive um, that explanation. So mm -hmm. how are these different factors related to each other? Uh, can you use the most important features in that database uh, that is smaller scaled in the Netherlands? And so that's one of the approaches that we are planning to take. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm a, I'm personally a little bit skeptical about the, about the term explainable AI because it sounds so great. So we we build a model, and the model does some good work. But now we want to know why the model does that work because if we know that, we can see if it generalizes. That which sounds nice, but usually these models are so incredibly complex that as soon as you're going to say, well, this is the the feature that is responsible for something, then you're pulling something out of a model that has an enormous complexity and try to simplify it. But that simplification usually then loses the power of the model. That's what I'm thinking. But I don't know what your experience is in this. <laughs> well, we don't have experience on that yet. So that was one of the avenues that we are uh, envisioned to take. Um, but we're open to all uh, no, <laughs> possibilities. Yeah, so, okay, well, this is, of course, why, why we collaborate, because the, in general, um, we don't know enough anymore about how artificial intelligence actually worked. In the past, we did know. It's 30 years ago, I worked in AI, and then but we know exactly knew exactly how everything worked because we programmed it in, and now it is okay. Let the computer learn something, and now we don't know anymore. But it's working better than if we would program it in. Now, if you say, well, and then we're gonna pull things out that we would actually be able again to put in a program uh, that we can understand, then why didn't we do this immediately? Um, because that was impossible that AI learns something that is very complex and, and making it simple again is, might not work. But we simply don't know. This is part of the AI research, basically, what, what is still possible here. And these kind of questions, that's also something that we cannot solve. So we need to collaborate again. And that's why we collaborate with people from TSHD. Yeah. Um, so in this, uh, in this lab, you see that different faculties actually uh, collaborate to make this kind of research possible. Okay. So um, can, can we talk a bit about the future? So where are these things going, both in the kind of projects that you do and the and then looking specifically at Marlene, because 
well, the zero hunger lab is somewhere and now it's going to continue and it's further growing. So where is it going? And maybe if you have any insight in that, what kind of technologies do you see? Maybe things that have come up in the recent years that could potentially be applied for the goals of the labs? Um, so I think this is going uh, more towards using all the public data that is out there. Um, so earlier you asked the question, why is this all possible now? Uh, well, because people are generating more data and meaning that we can analyze more and get more insights in how these systems work uh, based on the rain, based on uh, macro uh, systems. Um, so I suspect that uh, this is uh, going to be an even more important part of the work that we do. We've only scratched the surface. Um, we're just beginning to use these tools and techniques. Um, so that's one of the things. Another thing is that um, uh, data science and AI is, has been uh, reasonably well established now in uh, in uh, commercial av avenues in the in industry. However, in uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, they are not that far ahead with data science as industry is, uh, simply because they don't have the means. Uh, they're not a commercial commercial organization. Uh, they uh, depend on donors who donate money specifically for certain projects. So not for digitalization, for example. Um, so I also think that uh, these organizations are now becoming more digitized and are becoming uh, are going to be using this data science more, partially because researchers are paying attention to it and partially because within the industry there have been developments that they can now use. Yeah, by the way, I don't think that but so you can say an industry is 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 further ahead, but I there are probably particular industries which are further ahead. Yeah. A lot of the industries are still also lagging behind and just looking, okay, is that something that we actually need to use? The only reason I think that industries have to 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 invest more on in this is if their competitors are doing it, yeah. they, they might have to do it as well. So that or is a driving force. Well. Yeah, of course, core. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, about uh, so maybe this is too early to to talk about because you now talked about your initial projects. But where do you see this going? Yeah, I think the use of uh, machine learning and, and AI it's now uh, mainly important uh, in this phase because we need to get insights into all these relationships I talked about. So. Uh, I think the next couple of years, we will be still in that phase. But the next step would then be to try to intervene, to set up uh, interventions and to test those interventions. Um, but uh, yeah, as as mentioned, we're still in the, the beginning phase. So we start out with uh, trying to find the relationships, um, even um, looking at um, prenatal data, uh, because also, even when the child is not born yet, uh, maternal stress, for instance, can affect already the baby. Um, and there's also some data available there. Um, so we look into all uh, different age ranges, see where the effect is largest or where we can intervene best, then to take the next step, uh, come up with recommendations, uh, try to set up interventions that tap into uh, the factors that we uh, focus on more. Uh, that we, we found most important. Um, but I think um, certainly at this uh, initial stage, um, the techniques we were talking about are crucial. Yeah, because uh, I, a little, I would like to turn this back a little bit just to get think a little something a bit more clear. I'm thinking if you would talk about poverty in general, you can see the effects that poverty has so you can define it these kind of effects we want to avoid you have already a lot of data probably on the people that are affected and on other people who are not affected and you can look at the differences you bring the brain in there so and i would think that is the brain really needed or is the brain for you really the explanation for the effects do you think it is actually needed to identify and provide solutions for poverty I think it's crucial, of course. <laughs> yeah, okay, no. That's uh, why I'm asking. 
<laughs> now, as I said in the, the beginning, so the effects of poverty and all the related factors uh, on behavior uh, are mediated by the brain. So um, it is the brain that actually causes people to act in particular ways, to choose uh, or make specific uh, decisions. If you can change uh, specific connections in the brain, for instance, uh, that uh, are related to specific uh, cognitive functions so that they make other decisions, um, you can change. Uh, okay. So, so can, can I then, maybe to this too simple, but you say, well, we have a group of people and they're actually in the same circumstances and you don't see any differences, but at some point, some people are going to suffer from poverty and others are not. And that is because of their behavioral choices. Or is that how I should see it? Yes, and um, that's also something we want to look into is can you actually make prediction models um, based on all the data we have, uh, also combination of um, social demographic uh, information, the, the, the brain, uh, cognitive uh, functioning, um, can we actually make predictions to, to say which people will end up in poverty uh, or will get out of poverty or uh, yeah, will suffer in, in the long term uh, of the them? effects yeah. of poverty they have now. Yeah. Okay, and, and I just am reminded now again uh, uh, to the big, the, I think the big difference between the two, what the two of you are, or the two labs are focusing on is the individual in the zero poverty lab and the huge conglomerates, the countries, civilizations, villages of, of in in the the zero hunger lab that, that is the and and both are incredibly complex individuals are incredibly complex and 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 the the macro um structures in the world are incredibly complex yeah. but there's of course also a a, a connection because poverty leads to hunger and hunger again affects the brain um so i don't think we can do without each other <laughs> <laughs> okay well yeah so you already mentioned why because this is one of the things that i was thinking about is why why would we do this at tilburg university and one reason at tilburg university is that we we represent even though we are a relatively small university we represent both the the technological side of artificial intelligence techniques for instance but also the economical sides the ethical sides legal sides and the behavioral uh, uh, sides of of science so um is there something more so are, are there other places so I, I would have a feeling that tilburg university is ideal for this but i can imagine that other universities universities or institutes would claim that as well what what do you think in the netherlands for instance or worldwide well in an, uh, we collaborate a lot for example with wageningen um, because wageningen has uh, the uh, agricultural knowledge and for food, that is super relevant yeah. and super interesting. Yeah, okay. So there's also collaboration with other universities. Yeah, I, I would course. imagine that, yeah. yeah. But we can do a lot inside the university. Definitely. I, I think. Um, anything more that you want to remark on that? So what I think I would like to, uh, to talk at the end here is a bit about your own research. So what is your personal interest? What are you doing in in these labs or outside that actually, because you probably have also research that is not involved directly with the lab. And um, well, can you say something about that? Um, yeah, so um, my main focus is always to use mathematics and data science in such a way that it can help our society. Um, so uh, there are many applications of data science and AI. Many of them aimed at uh, commercial sites. Um, and that is something uh, that has led to a lot of development. But personally, I'm more interested into uh, topics that are directly related to sustainability. Uh, hunger is a very good example of that. Mm -hmm. Health is a very good example of that. Um, poverty is a good example. Climate change, all these sorts of topics uh, interest me a lot. and. For me, that has led, has brought me to the Zero Hunger Lab, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so my main interest is, of course, the brain um, and the relation of the brain, the structure of it, the functioning of that brain um, with behavior. 
Um, both in healthy populations and in clinical populations. So if, um, what if uh, a patient has a particular lesion at a particular side of the brain? How does that affect uh, the functioning of that brain and then um, yeah, the functioning of that uh, patient? Um, so there are internal uh, factors that can affect uh, brain structure and function, but there are also external factors, uh, for instance, fatigue, stress, um, poverty, and all related factors. So it's really about um, the effect of in internal and external factors on the structure and functioning of the brain and how that then translates into the functioning of uh, people in their attention, memory, executive functioning, all these yeah, cognitive functions in general. Okay. Well, very interesting. So um, I, I think that maybe we should return to these kind of topics in, in a year or two. And then uh, then let's see how, how things have progressed uh, until then. We also have uh, uh, within the Taisei Talks smaller presentations that we can, uh, can probably do at some point. But uh, of course, there's still a lot of work to be done. Is there anything that you want to, uh, to say to conclude this session? Um, I think uh, we discussed a little bit also, uh, you, you started out this talk with uh, the negative effects of AI, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the effects uh, of that AI can have is that um, people stay behind. So generally, this is a development. This is something that we can use. This is something that can help us in many ways. Um, but usually when you see technological developments, you see that uh, quite a big group of people uh, has an advantage of that, but an even bigger group of people stays behind, cannot use it, and that makes the gap between these groups even bigger. Uh, and uh, what I hope is that we can be aware of that, and uh, we can be uh, uh, aware of that with the result that we designed the techniques to include everybody. You already earlier mentioned that only a small par uh, portion of the population is using uh, social media, for example, in that sense, we should be aware of it. But also in the goals that we have when developing our AI tools, with what goal do we develop AI? Um, and we can also develop them in such a way that also the most vulnerable people can uh, benefit from that. Or not also, but in particular, the most vulnerable people can benefit from developments in AI. Yes, I th think this is a very important remark that you make here because indeed i i noticed that there's a lot of enthusiasm about of ai but it's always coming from the same groups of people yep, exactly and that people certain people are lagging a bit behind but they can catch up but there's probably large numbers of people that cannot make that uh, connection and then exactly fall yeah. further and further behind yeah. And once I heard somebody say, um, okay, so uh, in Western countries, we went from the regular phone to the mobile phone. Uh, then in other countries, they can skip the old fashioned phone and go to the mobile phone directly. But that's not how it works. That is what you would like to see happening, but that's simply not how it works. So we should really be aware of these things. Thank you. Wouter, anything more that you want to add to this? No, I think it uh, is an important uh, warning for you. <laughs> Marlene, uh, yeah, really uh, tapped into very uh, something very crucial we should uh, be aware of. So I uh, agree completely with that. Okay. Well, then thank you very much, and uh, I will see probably see the two of you again in the near future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks.